Hello, hello everyone. Good evening po. By the way, again, this is Nurse Bam from Noble Life International Davao Branch. So, may great good morning po sa lahat ng mga tag nasa uh, United States of America po. Hello po, good morning po sa lahat dyan. And of course, good afternoon naman po in some parts of um, Europe at saka syempre sa Middle East. So to all our Muslim brothers and sisters, uh, Ramadan Karim po. They are um, now uh, uh, celebrating the month of Ramadan. Ayan po. And of course, good evening naman sa lahat ng taga-Asia, especially dito naman sa Pinas. So before, let me greet po our top management, syempre, headed by our CEO and President, Madam Lila Bailon Makapinlak. Hello po ma'am, good evening. And of course, our Chief Finance Officer, Sir Don Makapinlak. Our man uh, General Manager, Ma'am Judy Pascual. Our Medical Director, Dr. Romeo Arteza. Hello po, Doc. Good evening. So, uh, of course, hindi naman pa pahuli yung ating mga international branches. Siyempre, yung Europe branch natin. Meron po tayo sa Netherlands and sa Germany. And hello po kay Sir Tony Naluz uh, na andyan din po sa Singapore ngayon with Ma Madam Lila. Hello po, Sir Tony. And of course, we have our Hong Kong branch, our Singapore branch, and our UAE branch. We have three branches there. Sharjah, Dubai, at saka po Abu Dhabi. Andyan po si Doc Bong. Hello po, Doc Bong. How are you po? And syempre yung ating Philippine branches, yung local branches natin. Our headquarters nasa Cubao, Quezon City. Andyan po si Ma'am Jing. And we have... Uh, And to all po ng staff ng lahat ng branches po sa Baguio, we have Tugigaraw Branch, Tarlac, we have um, Legaspi, Calapan, we have also Daet Branch, and we have um, Batangas Branch, we also have Cebu in Visayas, and dito sa Mindanao, we have Tagum, General Santos, and of course, our Davao City Branch. Ayan, good evening po sa lahat ng... And dito and I welcome you po para sa another very informative talk po natin for tonight. We will be tackling about colorectal or in short colon cancer. So ayan po. But before po we will proceed to our um, talk for the main program. Uh, we will have this first short uh, commercial break. And we will be right back.
Ayan. And again, we're back para po sa ating health talk for tonight. So, before po we will start, let me introduce po para po sa ating guest speaker. So, our speaker will tackle everything about colorectal cancer. So, we are so fortunate that um, because through his knowledge and of course his expertise, he can be able to share to us all we need to know about colorectal cancer. So, you know, further ado, let me introduce our guest speaker. Hindi po basta-basta yung guest speaker natin pang international to. He is a professor in He Nan Kong Chang Bones and Joint Care Research Center in Zhangzhou, China. He is also the Executive Director, International Council for the Standardization of Management for Bones and Joint Care in Beijing, China. He is the founding chairman in Philippine Society for Bones and Joint Care, vice president in Quezon City Medical Society. He is fellow International College of Surgeons, president in Metro Manila chapter, and former governor in International College of Surgeons, Philippine section. He's also fellow and diplomate in orthopedics, Philippine Academy of Medical Specialists, Chairman of Board of Trustees, and former National Chancellor for Orthopedic Surgery. He is also a nutrigenomics practitioner and DNA profiler consultant. So siguro nagtataka kayo, no? ano kaya itong nutrigenomics na to? Diba? For some of us, this uh, word or this term is new. So let me give you uh, a short background about this. So nutrigenomics, it is the study of how food affects a person's genes and how a person's genes affects the way the body responds to the food. So it is used to learn more about our genes and diet, how they are connected together, and how they can affect a person's health, especially the risk of developing diseases such as cancer. So ayon, yung nutrigenomics pala. So study of food or the nutrients or the nutrition, the food, that will, will affect a person's genes or yung mga DNA natin, yung genes natin. It will be affected. So, ayun. That is nutrigenomics. So, he is a nutrigenomics practitioner and DNA profiler consultant. So, our guest speaker is an orthopedic surgeon, no other than Dr. Joseph Rylan Flores. Hi! Kumusta? Hi, Bam! Kumusta lahat ng nandito sa harapan natin ngayon? And uh, katulad na nabagit ni Bam, kung saan man kayo sa buong mundo, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I hope all of you are okay ha, sa mga panahon na ito. At tuloy-tuloy uh, pa rin ang ating pagbibigay alam sa ating mga kababayan here and abroad. Yes. Yes, Pop. So, okay, Doc. I will give you all the time. The floor is okay. yours. Thank you so much, Bam. So, again, kung saan man kayo nandoon, kumusta? I hope all is okay. At alalahanin natin na depende kung saan, COVID is still around. So let us just keep ourselves safe from uh, getting sick. But let us discuss for tonight, although hindi sa mga buto ito, let's discuss itong tinatawag na colon cancer. So, lalong-lalo na, kasi Abril ngayon, last month, katatapos lang ng uh, tinatawag natin National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. So, it's about time that we actually discuss about colon cancer. So, but let's start off with trying to find out how toxic are we. Sa totoo lang, um, nagkaroon ng pagsusuri sa Amerika at tiningnan nila ang um, dugo, ang ihi of uh, adult Americans. And uh, they found out that there are actually 167 compounds in averaging of at least 91 per person. And what they've discovered is that 76 of these compounds actually cause cancer. 94 are toxic to the nervous system. 
92, uh, 82 rather affects the lungs, 86 affects hormones, and 79 actually cause birth defects. Now, on the other hand, the Red Cross found in unborn babies, mas mahigit pa, 287 chemicals in the baby's blood, and having 217 toxic to the brain and nervous system. 180 can actually cause cancer, and 208 uh, can cause birth defects in animals when they tested it. That's the reason why these were already unborn babies because they were not compatible to life. Now, we're, talk we're going to be talking about cancer. What is cancer? It actually refers to a large group of diseases which is characterized ng uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells. And it actually spreads not just to the neighboring tissues around the area, but to distant organs in the body. And unfortunately, if this is left untreated, everything else will go to that, car to that carcinoma and none will be left for the actual body. Hence, it might actually succumb to an eventual mortality. So which means these are actually cells that is basically seen in other parts of the body. It's just that it is not supposed to be found in a particular area and then it flourishes in that area. That's what actually carcinoma is all about. Now, cancer is just literally the tip of the iceberg. Pag sinabihan ng isang tao na may cancer, akala natin guguho na ang mundo nila. But in reality, no matter how fast or aggressive a particular cancer is, you still have time. You still have time to do a lot of things that you would want to do. You still have time to, you know, do a lot of closures and do everything else that can be done. But what is dangerous is not being diagnosed with cancer, but we actually being diagnosed with a whole lot of disease entities that can affect you and that can actually cause a sudden problem for you, unlike cancer. And what am I talking about? We're talking about metabolic problems like your diabetes mellitus, your hypertension, your dyslipidemias or hypercholesterolemias, and literally obesity. Nowadays, we are uh, looking at obesity as a disease entity and that we are encouraging not just people who are living with obesity, but to healthcare practitioners as well, to be not to be that uh, apprehensive, but to be able to consult about weight problems and about living with obesity. In contrast, for healthcare practitioners, um, to actually nudge and give a start for conversations with whom they might think that have problems with weight and obesity. So the thing is, studies have shown that it takes six years for a person, once they identify that they have problems with obesity, to go to a practitioner and consult about obesity. You know, it's not that so much it's a problem. The problem are the underlying disease entities that can be present because one is obese. So all of the other things, that's why it's actually bigger than the diagnosis of carcinoma. And the bottom line is, if you notice, problems don't start when one is getting old or an adult or even a senior citizen. Nowadays, it actually begins at a very, very early age with overnutrition. Lalo na ngayon, we've just had a pandemic and we hope that this pandemic will soon be lowered down to an endemic and eventually gone, like other pandemics that have happened uh, in history. Most of our children are actually at home, studying from home, not being able to go out. So what happens? Their activities are very much curtailed. They wouldn't want to do exercises at home. They end up in the bed. They end up in the couch. And just simply to their devices. The problem lies now with what consumption of food they would take in amidst your Netflix, your iPads, your telephones, or whatever game uh, device you might have. And that where overnutrition actually is very much present nowadays. And it increased much more because of what just happened 
uh, the past two years because of COVID-19. So when we do look into carcinoma, we just don't look at cancer per se. We look at the holistic person as to what is their component and what they can actually do and what is going on currently, not just if they are diagnosed or not with carcinoma. Of course, when we talk about carcinoma of the colon, it's the food we eat, saturated fats. Um, you know, nowadays everything's instant, everything's uh, with ease. The problem is the saturated fat that is present in most of these things are actually very, very high. That's the reason why uh, we're saying as much as possible to try to be picky about what you eat because it's not so much as you're eating or not eating. It's actually what you're eating. You may be eating a lot, but if it's not healthy food, then uh, not much of health. But if you are not eating as well, then malnourishment can come in. And when, when one is malnourished, problems can now arise because of that. So all of these things would come into play. That's why we would actually ask our patients and whoever we get a chance to talk to to simply be picky with what you eat. Hindi pihi ka na, hindi kayo kakain basta-basta. But to look into what food is present and what food you can take in, which means there is always a choice. Of course, if you would have beef, pork versus chicken versus fish versus vegetables, I wouldn't say don't eat any of those. But of course, you can have your beef, you can have your pork, but just make sure that all of these things are, you know, in moderation. In as much as your vegetables, green and leafy, the more the merrier, that's better. Go ahead, be my guest. You can even eat sacks load of that with a whole lot of, uh, of your pretty much nourishment as far as minerals, as far as vitamins are concerned, and all of these other things. Now, when it comes to choices, not just food per se, but how we actually cook food. Of course, if we could probably grill our food, but not too much that you actually char it because that would also become problems versus putting it in a stew or sinasabawan versus frying it would also be a choice option given to you. And of course, is it store-bought? Is it prepared outside? Or you get the chance to prepare your own food. So all of these things, there always is a choice as far as eating is concerned. That's why when we talk about processed foods, let's take rice, for instance. Rice options would be, instead of your white rice, of course, we know that the white rice is actually very good and tasty. We would probably opt for the non-refined ones like your brown rice or red rice or even black rice, multicolored for some. It just simply means that the fiber is still there. Hence, the absorption isn't that fast. Your glycemic index, ito po yung uh, actual sugar, pag nag-breakdown, inaabsorb ng katawan, is kind of low for these things that actually have fiber in them. Of course, when you talk about sugar, the more so with sugar. Your white sugar versus that of brown sugar versus that of probably your molasses versus that of your cocoa sugar or your muscovado or probably even honey as a sweetener. You all have options. So point being is that we all have options. Question is, would we be looking into the option that is safer and that is technically better for us, healthier for us? Or we go for what's easy, what's, you know, fast food, countertop, and just because, not that we're lazy, but most of, of the time, more often than not, we would say that we don't have time. You know, time actually is something that you'd have to manage on your own and find out the most plausible and feasible aspect that you can work with because that is what you would have to hold on to in the long run. Now, you notice on your slide in front of you, the natural constipation relief. Of course, in reality, you know, like, like we have to go, how often would you actually go to the bathroom and relieve yourself? Um, well, once a day is reasonable enough, but if you actually go two, three times in a day, 
it's not necessarily a loose bowel movement automatically. Remember, how often do you actually eat? Most of the time, we would probably eat once, twice, thrice. That's your breakfast, lunch, and your dinner. More often than not, I'm a Filipino, hindi lang lunch, breakfast, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We would have merienda in between. We would have midnight snacks. We would have a whole lot of snacks in between. Then how often would you actually have to relieve yourself? So in reality, as often as you actually eat, you can go to the bathroom and relieve yourself. But of course, that sometimes isn't too um, comfortable or isn't too practical considering if we are at work. Nowadays, we are most are actually going back to their offices. So that's the reason why once a day is quite practical and reasonable. But what if it's not just once a day? It's once every two days, once every three days. Heck, there are even some once every five, six, seven days. So you could just imagine what happens in that gut of ours. That is where problems lie. But is that problem just because of other things? Or is that problem because we already have a mass that's going on and happening in our colon? Worried about food. I'm not showing you because of, uh, I'm not misogynistic. I'm just actually showing that height of a burger some would say that's, uh, you know, that's just good for a picture, but no. We've actually seen people devour that high of a patty. And if you notice that patty, that's probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You could just imagine the saturated fat in it. You could just imagine the cholesterol that's going to be in there, your triglycerides that's going to be in there, the lipoproteins that's going to be in there. Not to mention, not just the fat, but the sugar component, um, all the things that can actually have a problem. I'm not saying don't eat a burger. Just don't eat a seven patty long burger, that high of a burger. Once is enough, twice is enough, probably in a week, okay, but not too much, which means that most of the time, all of us end up just eating with fast foods. That's where actually our problems begin. I'm not saying also that don't eat in a fast food. I myself enjoy a burger from uh, popular fast food chains every now and then, but... Don't go there every day and eat the entire menu from breakfast, lunch, and dinner and probably consume that whole menu just because you don't have time to prepare or don't have time to cook. So there are a lot of other things that could be healthier. Options are always present. You just have to look for them. Now, we're going to be talking about colon cancer. So to be able to understand it, let's understand first the anatomy. What happens? When we actually eat, when we actually chew food, we start by chewing our food. Why? You would notice that there is already a salivary amylase that is occurring in our mouth. Um, it's called the Amy one That's one of the genes Bam mentioned about nutrigenomics already. That's a very good description of what nutrigenomics is. It's looking into your genes. Your genes cannot be replaced anymore. That's what you are that's who you are but the question is are your genes beneficial or not and some of the genes we can actually modify the expression that's why if you have beneficial genes we would want to maintain benefits coming from that gene but if we have non-beneficial genes then we'd have to do some things to make these genes beneficial so that it could better our body's constitution and everything else that happens in our body, chewing is one of them. Trying to stimulate our Amy1, that's one gene, wherein it already helps in absorption and metabolism of the breakdown of our kinakain into sugars. So when we do chew, we swallow it. It goes through your epiglottis. It's a little moon po natin. Magkadikit po yan. Uh, merong bumabara doon sa ating daanan ng hangin uh, papunta sa lungs at meron yung trachea na tinatawag and then sa likod niya nandoon yung tinatawag na esophagus kung saan papasok yung food. And there's a bar that actually or a, an organ that actually moves back and forth so that every time we swallow it covers the trachea so food won't go to the trachea. That's the reason why kuminsan nasasamig tayo because we talk, we laugh, we holler, 
hindi na kukuha ang magsara. At pag hindi nagsara yung food na pupunta doon, yung particles, you know, that's very, very sensitive. That's the reason why we end up na uubo na sasamir. Now, coming to that, you have your esophagus right smack in the middle. And then it actually goes to the left where your stomach is. And your stomach is literally a bag, if you notice, uh, dito po sa ating drawing. And then it curves back to the center where it now becomes your small intestines. There are three of your small intestines, your duodenum, your je uh, jejunum, and your ilium. The difference would be your duodenum is quite short because that's just a connection from your stomach to the actual bulk of your small intestines. And your small intestines is divided upwards with your jejunum and your ilium and the lower part. Halu-halu yan, labu-labu yan. Think of isaw, di ba? Now, it goes to all the way to the right lower quadrant where your appendix is found. That actually signals the division between your small intestines and your large intestines known as your colon. So that base down there is what you call your cecum. It goes up your ascending colon. It breaks into a flexure. It's called the hepatic flexure because your liver is actually there. Going straight, somewhat, your transverse colon, and then having another bend, which we call your splenic flexure because your spleen is actually just right behind it. And then going down, your descending colon. Then you have your sigmoid, which is that S portion, and then your rectum all the way down to your anal verge and your anus. So your food, what happens once you chew it? It is beginning to be broken down in your mouth and from there it actually now is swallowed thereby traveling the esophagus there is no absorptive capacity in the esophagus it simply is a connection between your mouth and your stomach and then it now goes down to your stomach that is where the breakdown happens that's the reason why there are acids in the stomach it literally breaks down. And when it breaks down food, it breaks down to simple sugars. That's what your carbohydrates is all about. It also breaks down your proteins. It also breaks down your a little fat that you eat or depending on how much fat you actually consume. But it now boils down into simple sugars. That is absorbed together with other nutrients and everything else that we would eat. That's your natural ligand. So what happens when it reaches your intestines, all the nutrition that we've actually eaten and been broken down is now absorbed so that it will be for full use of our bodies. Now, when that happens, everything else will now be coming to a waste because they're in excess of. And when it reaches your colon, here is where your water is now reabsorbed, you know, water. That's the reason why most of the time we would tell our patients to simply hydrate, two liters in a day, at least. If you're in the Philippines right now, it's kind of hot. If you're in other Asian countries like Singapore, uh, Thailand, or Hong Kong, it's kind of hot at this point in time. It's beginning to become summer. You need more water in reality. So, water is reabsorbed in the entirety of the colon. And if you notice simple drawing here in front of us, you would see your small intestines relatively straight because everything in the small intestines is basically liquid in origin. That's the reason why it readily absorbs anything and everything that we eat or when it's, it's broken down. But when it reaches our colon, our waste actually now becomes packed. It becomes solid. That's the reason why you'd notice that they're like circles around it. They're not really circles, but they have haustrations. And these haustrations, actually its purpose is to move that solid bowel. That's the reason why it actually pushes that waste material so that it will go up, it will go sideways, it will go down to your left, and all the way to the anal verge. And then when you do visit the bathroom, you send it out. 
That's the actual anatomy of our gut. And that is what happens to food and what happens to everything else. So, presuming there's not much of a problem, but you are dehydrated, the likelihood of our stools becoming more solid increases because water is now being reabsorbed. You are now left with a very, very solid excreta. That's the reason why it sometimes is difficult to push all these waste materials. That is why most become constipated. That's the reason why, first and foremost, for those who are constipated, we actually start to simply hydrate and rehydrate. Because if stools are not as solid and they're still, you know, with a somewhat liquidy factor, then it's easier to actually release them. Kasi sabi man po, dun sa mga nag-uumpisa ng kumain, kasi medyo nag-ahapon na yata ang iba. So that's the most important thing to understand as far as the anatomy is concerned because that is where the abnormal now will be looked into. As long as we know what the normal would be, everything that's beyond normal is now abnormal. So the easiest way to look into a problem is to do your scans. You can do your CT scan, you can do your MRI. It actually shows your abdomen and probably the entire body. Nowadays, with city scans gone, where you need to probably have 30 minutes to an hour just to do a city scan. City scans nowadays are just seconds for one part of the body. Your lungs would take eight seconds. Your abdomen would take eight seconds. Your brain and everything else would probably take eight seconds each. It won't even cost you a minute to actually scan the entire body. And that's the easiest one to look into. But unfortunately, uh, there are some areas, especially in the far-flung areas, that don't have CT scans in the laboratories. But of course, it's not just CT scans and MRIs or their magnetic resonance imaging. But there are other examinations that we look into, like blood workup and everything else. But this is one of the easiest ways to look into if there are problems, especially in your abdominal area, especially in your colon. But there are two ways to actually look into your colon. There's an indirect exam, which we actually call your barium enema. And what's barium? The indirect exam is actually an x-ray. We take a look at your body via x-rays. And in x-rays, the thing is, it sees calcific densities. Ibig sabihin, ang nakikita lang niya, buto. Anything that's not buto, they're all spaces. Your barium is one very, very opaque medium. That's the reason why it's enema. Literally, linalabatiba. And what does happen? Just to give you a picture, this is what we do. Ini enema namin yan. And barium is what's containing in that bag. Now, what happens is in the bed or your x ray bed, we will actually flow that barium opposite direction of your normal flow of your colon. Remember, I mentioned going down right lower quadrant, that's where your colon begins all the way up to the left and down and then to the center, which means that using the barium enema, it's going to be opposite. So what happens is once the enema starts, we tilt the bed so that it will go up and then we move it to the side so that it will move to your left side and then later on flat so that it will travel through the transverse colon and then moving it to the right. And then afterwards standing it up and eventually all the way like the bed is literally now standing up because it follows that pathway. And all these times, x-rays are taken by batches so we could see the flow, so we could see the normal anatomy of your colon. So let me show you this area. Look at the one on the left first. That's actually a normal flow of your barium. If you notice, you see the haustrations? Like I said, they are the ones that are actually pushing the waste down. But sometimes there could be spasticity, like here. You actually have thin areas where your colon is spastic. Or sometimes, in the contrary, hostrations are gone. You end up with a balloon of a colon, which means it doesn't want to move because there's a balloon right smack there. Um, just don't mind the clamps. They're not inside. They're actually outside. Of course, we would also have the irritable bowel syndrome, 
if you notice, not just that they're spastic, but they're literally irritated. That's the reason why it moves up. That's the reason also why it doesn't look normal as well. But if we would see other lesions, remember I told you, anything we see is uh, that's white is actually bone. Linings are not. That's the reason why we put in your barium. And sometimes we would see areas of blockage just like this. We're in, we see what we call a polyp. Sometimes we would see what we call diverticuli. We have several of them. They're not cancerous. They're not a problem. But they might eventually end up to be one. That's the reason why we do biopsies of all these areas. But this is just an imaging technique. What we now look into more often than not is a direct examination, what we call an endoscopy, or specifically for our lecture for tonight, a colonoscopy. And that's simply a colonoscopic machine. It's actually very um, flexible because we do have a proctosigmoidoscopy uh, wherein we have this rigid tube that will only look and see up to the beginning of your sigmoid colon. But remember, we would want to look at the entire colon. Hence, we have a flexible one. That's your flexible colonoscope. And it's actually connected to a camera. And we do see it via a monitor. And like your barium enema, it flows contrary to the proper flow of your colon, which means we begin with your anal verge. And then all the way up to your rectum, to your sigmoid colon, to your descending colon, to your transverse, and all the way down to your ascending colon and to the cecum until we see the appendix. And we stop there. Why? We no longer go through your small intestines. We don't look at your small intestines, not that much. Why? Because the consistency of the tissues of your small intestines differ from your large intestines. Since your large intestines would actually have stuff that are solid, probably tough, and rigid, that's the reason why we actually have thick colons. In contrast, the lining of our, or even the entire tissue of our small intestines is very, very soft, very, very thin, very, very smooth, which means that if that scope accidentally goes beyond your cecum, the likelihood of you puncturing that small intestines increases. That's the reason why when we see the appendix, we already stop because that's where the junction of your ilium and your cecum begins. So how do we look at our endoscopies, specifically our colonoscopies? If you look at that normal colon lining, you'd actually see very, very smooth, very, very pink, and literally just one house station after the other. That's what a normal colon would look like. But if there's a lesion and there's a mass, we already would be able to see it. And if we see one, we already take a small puncture of that, a small uh, pinch of that rather, and send it for biopsy. If we can get the whole thing, much better. But if we cannot, at least get a good cut of that and send it for histopathologic studies and your biopsy. As I said, your polyp is basically benign. Let me qualify everything else before I continue. Once we see an abnormal lesion or a space occupying lesion or a mass in general, we call it a new growth, a new growth is termed as a tumor. So a tumor can be benign, which is relatively okay, and it could also be malignant, which is cancerous. Hence, if somebody says that there is a tumor, that is not cancer. It simply means that there is a space-occupying lesion, a mass or a new growth that is present, which still has to be identified if it is benign or malignant. That's the reason why we do biopsy studies, to find out if these areas and sections are actually benign or malignant. That's another picture of a polyp, if you actually see this. If you notice, everything else is smooth, a little pinkish, and yet you see this lesion of a polyp. On the other hand, when we do see other areas like these, it's no longer smooth. It's very rough. 
It's not pink. It's very red. And you actually see different anomalies in the area. Eventually, if surgery is done, we take out these areas. Or sorry, not surgery, but uh, continue your endoscopies. These are areas that are possibly not polyps, but already cancerous lesion. That's why we literally take out. And most probably, these areas would be very bloody. Why? Because in any tumor, most especially cancerous ones, neovascularization happens. And that means that blood vessels are actually developed around the area to actually feed that carcinoma. That's the reason why nutrition doesn't go anymore to your body, but it goes to that cancer lesion. That's the reason why it enlarges and the possibility of it traveling these cells to every other different parts of the body can happen. So taking a punch biopsy of these areas can sometimes be a little bloody. That's the reason why we sometimes try to cauterize these areas as well. And like I mentioned, if surgery is done, you'd see these areas that are ulcerated with multiple lesions, not just well encapsulated like your polyp. Pakita niyo polyp kanina, very, very, um, just one single unit of a mass in contrast to carcinomas, which are broader in no definite uh, anatomy. These are normal cells surrounding it, but these are your cancer cells. Another picture of that. Here you have it, and that is on the opposite side. These are actually surgical sections that are cut already. Now, what's the root cause of all of these? It's simply basically our lifestyle on a daily basis. That's your food, that's your pollution, that's your stress, including unhealthy use of or misuse of medications, drugs most especially, and all of these are basically toxins. Now, what do we do about it? We clean it. That's the reason why we detoxify. We use cleanse. Um, it's an insoluble and soluble fiber. Why both? Because insoluble fiber simply means that it's like a broom that literally cleans that colon of ours. We need to make sure that that colon is clean so it is free of parasites, bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And the likelihood of hopefully having any lesion that can happen decreases. I'm not saying that just because your intestines are clean that there's a possibility that you're not going to have any cancer. Remember, there are a lot of things that can stimulate cancer, even if we do have cancer cells. So for that matter, we are just decreasing the risk of the possibility of any carcinoma by making sure that that intestine of ours, that colon of ours, is actually clean. Now, what else? We need soluble fiber because remember, like any broom, like any area of your house, you clean it with a broom, the nooks and crannies of your house literally won't be clean enough because your broom doesn't go into these nooks and crannies. That's where we need your soluble fiber. Because in this soluble fiber, it goes into the nooks and crannies of our colon. Remember the house trations? They actually have corners. And in these corners, we have to make sure that these also are clean. That's the reason why soluble fiber would go into these nooks and crannies, develop into the gel form or gel-like form, and be able to take out all of these toxins and eventually clean by our insoluble fiber. And that's actually how it would look like. These are all coming from detoxification. That's the reason why when we do visit the bathroom, we actually are able to make a good excretion of toxins from our bodies. And when we do detox the colon, a healthy colon will definitely prevent diseases. And by preventing diseases, indirectly now becomes slowing process of aging. Why? Because anytime that we are sick, anytime that we have a problem, it's a simple dehydration problem, anytime we have all of these, our metabolism increases. And when it does increase, it actually hastens that aging process. That's the reason why when one is sick, you see them in the next two or three days, they look as if they've aged and they just haven't aged like a year or so. They've aged a lot. More so if that disease entity lengthens and in a week's time, in a month's time, 
you'd really notice the aging process coming along. But if we do have healthy colons, the possibility of diseases decreases, it now slows down the aging process. That's why detoxifying actually is part of the anti-aging procedures that we would usually do in the clinics. Now, after cleaning it up, what happens next? We have to fix our body. And by fixing it, we do need nutrition. As I mentioned a while ago, it's eating that will give us all the nutrition that we need. It will give our bodies all the necessities it actually requires. From your macronutrients to your minerals to your vitamins, etc., etc., etc. That's where cryptomonodalis can actually help you. It has natural key parts. It's recognized by the experts as one of the most promising health food in the 21st century. Technically, it's an old slide because it's not just promising. It's already promised as we are already in the 21st century. It's been researched by world's most prominent medical doctors, and it's actually been discovered by this guy with a smiling face, Professor Wang Sung Te. And uh, they actually culture it in Taiwan and uh, in vats as big as with the pictures you actually see. And we know that because... Well, before going to that, let's just give you a little brief description of what cryptomonidalis is. It actually has a primitive structure. If you see this oval thing, it doesn't have any cell membrane. Hence, it's relatively diffused easily into our bodies. And it's got a rich amount of ribosomes and a lot of things. We will give you the profile of it in a while. But the more important thing is nutritionally, it is not a hindrance for it to be absorbed by our bodies. And like I mentioned, this is Professor Wang Sun Che. Those vats that you see at the back are actually where they cultivate Cryptomonidales. They started out with three, eventually with five. By the time I saw them, they had eight. I think they have 12. Mamlila, sorry, Don. Ilan Para alam ko, 15 na at this point in time. And we know that because we've actually been with him. He hosted it at one point in time, showed us the process of uh, collecting cryptomonidales, and that's practically just uh, around the three foot of a vat. And in there, what happens, it's collected and placed on these huge areas. If you notice this blue-green, because that's full of cryptomonidales, of course, it still has water, eventually going through the cleaning process. It needs to be cleaned. And all of these uh, artifacts can actually be segregated. And even the non-cryptomonidalis algae. I, I failed to mention, cryptomonidalis is simply an algae. An algae, in other words, lumon. And of course, it differs from the algae that we see just because it rained in the canals. There's some green moss there. Uh, that's already algae. No, these are actually medical grade algae that actually gives us a whole lot of nutrition. It's a whole food, a complete food. We'll show you in a bit. So going to removing all the artifacts and segregating cryptomonidalis from other forms of algae, it goes through several vats and eventually being dehydrated along that way. And once it's dehydrated, it is now dried and pretty much put in sacks like these. And they are now actually in powder form. There, you notice that it's in powder form, but it doesn't stop there. It's not back in a capsule, it's not placed inside a capsule, it is actually compressed into a tablet. And that's your uh, compressing machine. And that's the reason why, for those who have actually gotten a chance to use Cryptomonidales, it's quite of a very rough tablet form. And literally, if you try to pound it, it's grainy because that is 100% cryptomonidalis, no plus, no minus. That's just about it. Nothing more, nothing less. And that's what we take in already. Now, let me just show you a couple of slides. These are actually in their laboratories. Everyone knows or most know chlorella. And uh, it actually was one of those nutrition immune boosters. But if you notice under the microscope, you actually see a very circular cell of a chlorella. And if you notice that dark edge, it's not really dark. They're actually spicules all around it, giving you the dark appearance. That's the reason why it's sometimes difficult to absorb chlorella. 
in contrast your crypto money dollars like i mentioned it's very fine very smooth if you notice it's just a single layer that's why it's easily absorbed but the good thing is that chlorella growth factor is actually inside crypto money dollars it's one of the things contained in crypto money dollars and this is actually the team that went there Mamlila was with us and everybody else ako po yun standing out na yun and here is the nutritional profile of your crypto money dollars like i said it's basically food it's a complete food why it's got your macronutrients it's got your protein your carbohydrate and your fat you still need a little fat because there are a lot of things that have to be metabolized with fat but that's not the only thing there's chlorophyll like i said your chlorella growth factor and even your rna and dna but wait there's more you have vitamins you have your a your b complexes your c your e biotin and everything else but wait there's more you also have minerals you have minerals like your potassium which is a very important electrolyte you have copper you have magnesium which is actually included for immune functions your iron especially for those who actually have malnutrition anemia and as an orthopedic surgeon there is your calcium on top it's literally like taking in a glass of milk already or even two depending on how much you take of course we don't give this much i do give around five tablets in a day just as a regular thing but if you do have problems i increase it twice in a day or even thrice in a day but it's not supposed to change and replace proper eating which means you still have to eat food this is to supplement what you're eating to make sure that you receive all of these vitamins and minerals and to make sure that your macronutrients are you know at par but it will not supposed to be replacing the food that you're eating so it's still a supplement you still have to eat and you still have to eat well so crypto money does benefits it has a lot your PPAR will be discussing that in a while especially in carcinomas it also has chlorophyll it uh it also has a whole lot of things and going to PPAR what is PPAR peroxisome proliferate reactivated receptor I know it's a mouthful it took me a year to actually pronounce it properly technically in molecular biology it's simply a receptor now what does that mean it's a receptor which means it receives it will receive proteins it will receive ligands it will receive all the nutritional components that we are actually eating and consuming so that it will transcribe and eventually give us a proper cellular differentiation development and metabolism of our macro proteins our macro lipids and our macro carbohydrates your PPAR is actually a gene and hoping that it's beneficial but if it is not beneficial then consuming the right amount of cryptomonadalis can be beneficial to the point that it will change its expression to make it beneficial now what do i actually mean there uh, i'm supposed to have a video but unfortunately um it's uh, it's not playing so let me just give you this imagine for those in the philippines or anywhere in the world that we are driving through highways especially in malaysia there are a whole lot of highways in malaysia uh in the philippines you have the north luzon expressway to the north and the south luzon expressway of obviously to the south and what does happen your car gets in you line up in such a long line and then eventually wait to be processed so that you could pay the use of the toll then that bar goes up and then you drive until you reach the next uh toll gate and do the same process you know in repetitions but nowadays we do have this uh auto suite rfids um and what happens is that it's already 
tickered, it's stuck to your car already. And what happens? You drive along the highway, you go to that toll booth, you don't even wait for more than a second or two. Once the camera sees that sticker, it will notice and see that you actually have paid, prepaid your uh, toll gate prices. Boom gates go up and you now pass quite fast. You know, it won't spend, what, two seconds, three seconds at the most, depending on how fast you can press on that gas of your car. So that's actually what PPAR is all about. PPAR is that sticker of your RFID, which means like that car to be able to get to your destination, you still have to drive it, you still have to pass through that boom bar of a toll gate and still pass through the highway. We will not change that, which means we will still be eating, we will still be swallowing, our bodies will still be digesting, and because of the metabolism, being able to use all of the nutrition that we are able to eat via the absorption of our intestines. This is what happens. Because we have PPAR inside our cryptomidalis, it will now hasten or fasten your speed of that process in becoming it in a short span of time, which means when that natural ligand comes in, that nutritional component comes in, it's now received by PPAR, it is now transcribed by PPAR, and it is now processed and sent to wherever it is actually needed. You have problems in the liver, your liver will now have all of the nutritional support that it requires. You have a problem in your muscles, that does the same. You have a problem with your heart, a problem with other organs, it will do the same thing. So there will no longer be that long a line and the long processing before you actually pass through that toll gate. Similar thing happens with PPAR. It will already help and send it out to actually wherever it is needed. And depending on what, your PPAR could be your alpha, your beta or delta, and even your gamma pertaining to areas like your liver, your kidney, your heart, your brain, fat cells, and even your colon, especially for your PPAR GABA. So, before I continue, take a look at this. They're not hammers. They're actually biochemical equations of your agonists and natural products, which means this is what happens when PPAR metabolizes all of these things and transcribes all of these ligands. If you notice, there's an endogenous one because that is what it truly is versus that of your synthetic ligands. And I'll show you what's the importance of this slide. Again, this is just a schematics of absorbing. And by absorbing it, it actually helps out in the process of transcribing it and eventually sending it out to where it is needed. And the good effects, it actually has an activation process. It betters your lipid metabolism, how you metabolize fat. It also controls homeostasis of sugar, which means it maintains your sugar at a certain level because it actually helps the use of insulin in our pancreas. And like I mentioned a while ago, wherever it's needed, that's where cell differentiation comes in. Similar to the principle of stem cells. I'm not saying it's stem cells, but to differentiate the cell where it is actually needed is actually it's a whole long process. It becomes faster because of PPAR. And not just an activative straight uh, process, but it also represses things. And what does it repress? Your inflammatory reaction. It now becomes an anti-inflammatory component. Because in any part of our body, if we have a problem, we actually will have, well, inflammation. And this inflammation usually would complicate into other several problems. And what PPAR does is it helps in the anti-inflammatory component. So with your fat cells, instead of your long chain fatty acids in your liver and your muscles, 
giving you increased serum-free fatty acids, making you fatter because of your adipose cells. It goes the opposite. It attacks your adipose cells, decreasing all of these free fatty acids, thereby giving and decreasing your long-chain free fatty acids as well in your liver and also in your muscle. That's the reason why eventually you're supposed to be slimming down as well. In the bloodstream, uh, similarly, it actually will help in making sure that the efflux or removal of cholesterol in the bloodstream would be helpful and the adhesions of these plaques would actually decrease. This is what we call atherosclerosis. And because it happens indirectly, it also decreases your blood sugar, increases your insulin, and decreases your triglycerides, and increases your high-density lipoprotein or your good cholesterol. And because we do that, we actually also indirectly decrease the possibility of problems of vascular explosion or strokes, depending on where that blood vessel is found. You remember the hanger that I showed you? This is a perfect example of that. We actually have your pyoglitazone and your rosiglitazone. These are medications that are really good. They're given to diabetics. And uh, the thing is, who best to actually find a natural congener of all of these things? But none other than Professor Wang Sunte. He used to be with Takeda, developing all of these PPAR agonist drugs. So he was, he's actually the best person to look for a natural counterpart of all of these PPAR agonist components. So your cryptomonidalis can reduce the levels of cholesterol and low density lipoproteins up to 15 to 20% in one month. It can regulate your blood glucose levels, even your glycosylated hemoglobin or where your sugar component is on an average of three months. It can nearly normalize it in three to six months. Of course, it can modulate immune function. That's the reason why it's good for some dermatitis, some psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis. And for me as a surgeon, I use this for patients who are undergoing surgery for better wound healing. And of course, some antiviral effects and prophylactic and therapeutic effects for cancers. I would usually concentrate on the prophylactic component. Why? Like I said, it's food. It's not a drug. So it's not really uh, going to supposedly medicate your carcinoma. But if you still haven't have it, then it is supposed to make our body stronger so that it will not stimulate any cancer cells if we do have it, nor can it stimulate our bodies to create cancer cells. In contrast, if you do have cancers, your body needs the nutrition most of it as much as possible instead of the cancer feeding on your nutrition your body needs nutrition that's the reason why we still give it and that's the therapeutic component so let me just give you a few slides these are pilot trials on psoriatic arthritis arthritis there are a whole lot of causes number one of which is degenerative in nature 70 percent of the time but ganyan kakapal ang libro namin in arthritis napakadaming dahilan psoriasis is one of them if you know what psoriasis is, it's a dermatologic problem. You have scales in your skin. It flakes. It's very itchy. It actually does cause joint pains. That's why we would have psoriatic arthritis. And we use cryptomonidalis. And if you notice the pain score from 7.5 before, with the use of it in a month, it decreases. And in the next several months, still decreasing to a point of it's just less than three, which is somewhat of a pain that is bearable, that you can actually do your activities of daily living on a regular basis without hampering your lifestyle. Now, let me show you a picture of an individual with psoriasis. If you notice, like I said, erythematous, very red scales, silvery scales, and quite itchy for that matter. In three months, if you notice, that's November, that's February, that's three months you'd see relatively decrease in your lesions. Why? Because nutrition becomes better. Likewise, on the lower extremities, you have all of these patches of psoriasis. That's the reason why you have joint pains in the area. 
contrary to what we see three months later, it's now rather smooth and decreased. Looking into cholesterol levels in a month's time, it's 210. Normal values are supposed to be around 200. In just two weeks' time, we can bring them down to normal levels. And in four weeks, quite comfortable normal levels. But they only spent for a week, I mean for a month. Beyond it, because habits are the same, it rises up beyond. So that's the reason why we would want to continue it on a regular basis. And based on research, like I said, it just doesn't affect your gut. It just doesn't affect your intestines. It affects the whole areas of your entire body. It affects your liver, your brain, your heart, your kidneys, your digestive tract, and your lungs. And of course, our staff, we do have Professor Wang Sun Te, together with Dr. Eljen Su. They've developed uh, cryptomonidalis and the trials of it. Uh, Dr. Yu Seng Chao actually is the person who scrutinized these trials and have actually declared them uh, quite uh, true and credible. That's the reason why we do bring this to other countries as well. You have your local faculties. You have Dr. Orteza there, our medical director, and everybody else, Anjan Putayo. And we're just, just in the Philippines anymore. We're all around Asia. We're in Europe, and we're now beginning to be in the U.S. So we are now all over the world, in the Middle East as well. So more often than not, we might just be where you are anywhere. It's not going to be difficult anymore to locate us. So just as a slide, it's media coverage. Um, I don't mind that much media, but I usually want to look at the China TV news. In China, it's a different country, hence... Um, it's still communistic, which means that they will not do anything, nor will they send out any propaganda without passing through their government. And in this case, if it deals with health, it has to pass to the Ministry of Health. And for them to allow, they have actually scrutinized it and found it credible. And uh, just like what Dr. Il Sao has done. And seeing it in China TV news simply means that they've agreed because they have approved that the studies they've seen are actually true and credible. So I guess that's my last slide. Food is medicine. You know, if you notice, I didn't even talk about, you know, medicine, chemotherapy, and whatever radiation therapy. Let's not look into the deep things of it because otherwise I would send you to my colleagues who are oncologists or colorectal specialists. But at this point in time, our priority is to prevent any of these from happening. And food is literally a medicine. We eat well, we eat right, we eat the right amount of food, the right food at the right time. We hydrate ourselves, make sure we're well, we're well hydrated. Take a glass of milk, thank you very much. We need to move. Movement stimulates good bone growth and it flexes muscle, makes sure all our muscles are elastic. We do a 10,000 steps. You know, the good thing with people in other countries, they do their 10,000 steps. Makababaya natin, kahit nasan man kayo, they do 10,000 steps. Dito sa Pilipinas, not so much. And of course, avoid what needs to be avoided. Avoid alcohol, avoid smoking, avoid drugs. Avoid everything that needs to be avoided. And last but not the least, the fifth one. Make sure that you rest. I've seen people that, you know, rest well, they work well. But I've seen people as well that they forego rest. Their bodies will literally make them rest. The question would be, would you just rest at home, rest at a clinic or in the hospital, or rest six feet under? So just do all of these things. But if you cannot, there's a sixth one. Detox and supplement yourself to make sure that we you actually have the appropriate macronutrients needed, your vitamins and minerals that are needed. And I guess that's my last slide. Thank you so much for um, being with you uh, this morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. Maraming maraming salamat po.
Yes. Back to you, yes. ma'am. Yes, thank you, Dr. Raylan. That's a very informative and very enlightening message po yung, uh, yung talk mo. So, ayan po, everyone, if you have somebody na concerned about colorectal cancer, you can share this video to them. Ang dami pong matutunan po dito. And gustong gusto ko po yung sabi niyo, Doc, na we eat well, we eat right, we hydrate well. Di ko na nasundan. Ang bilis lang po yung sabi mo. Basta, yun. So, I-replay natin. <laughs> yes. I-replay ko na lang mamaya. Basta, yun. And of course, avoid. Because, yun nga sabi ni Doc, is food is our medicine. So, it all depends in the food that we eat, in the choices of the food that we eat. Yeah, let me just take this opportunity because we're not just talking to Filipinos here in the Philippines, but we're talking to Filipinos everywhere. We're, ta we're talking to non-Filipinos as well. That's the reason why we've done our lecture mostly in English. And if you do have questions, you could simply go here in Facebook and uh, we do have a page. It's Doc Ryland, just use that, R-Y-L-A-N. And you can actually ask your questions uh, in our page. And if you do have time every Saturdays, I will plug already. The, uh, I do have a uh, Facebook Live with Dr. Island every Saturdays, 7 p.m. Manila time. So if you do have a uh, spare time uh, on you, uh, try to visit it. Or if you can, we can always have a replay on everything else. But if you do need consults, we do teleconsults as well. So that even if you're uh, kind of far or even abroad, at least we would have uh, an idea on how we can help you so that you won't have difficulties with whatever your experience. Yeah, true. It's very easy now, na? Online. That's true. We That's can so true. some cons consultations online. So, ayun po. Every Saturday, 7 p.m. 7 p.m. And I do hope, uh, uh, Ma'am Lila, Sir Don, uh, traveling is becoming easier nowadays, so we do hope we can yes. get to visit you and do our talks live as we used to do pre-pandemic. Can't wait to go back to Singapore, Ma'am Lila. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully, sir, uh, Doc Ryland, hopefully soon we can have it. Yes, like and uh, so visit again. Uh, lalo na yung mga, uh, I miss seeing our mga kababayans in other countries like Italy, the Netherlands, uh, even in the U.S. So given the time, uh, because traveling is uh, becoming easier nowadays, uh, gone were those uh, quarantine time frames. So we might just get back into traveling and this time around visit you face to face. But for the meantime, since we're up on face to face, Facebook Live, po. we can always Facebook be here Live, for you. Yes, we can have this Facebook Live. Okay, so thank you so, so much, Dr. Ryan. Thank you so much. Very informative health talk. Okay, so again, uh, we thank you, everyone, for um, spending time with us with this very informative health talk. And of course, wag po kayong mahiya to share all, to all your friends, your family relatives who are having concerns about um, colorectal cancer. So you can share this very informative health talk. So again, thank you and good night everyone. This is again Nurse Bam from Noble Life International Davao saying Noble Life cares for you naturally. Ang katangian ng isang mahusay na karunungan Ay ang paggamit ng pinakanatural Sa mabisang produkto matatagpuan oh, Positibo sa lahat ng bagay Sa physical, emotional, at spiritual Sa ganahan sa buhay Ang hangat tinuman Nabola Ang kalusugan ay kayamanan Nabola Ay kayamanan sa kalusugan
Nasaan ang karamdaman? Isang bagong henerasyon Harapin ang hamon ng buhay May pag-ibig, tunay na kapayapaan Tagumpay at pagkakaisa sa lipunan Kalusugan ay kayamanan May kayamanan sa kalusugan Ang kalusugan ay kayamanan May kayamanan sa kalusugan Ang kalusugan ay kayamanan